Good afternoon, and welcome to Membership Monday, where we learn, grow, connect, and serve together to plant America. I'm Trish Bender, your National Garden Club Membership Chairman, along with our membership crew, Diane Dawson, Robin Hammer, and Bonnie Stockel. Um, We have a great program lined up for you today and every second Monday of this Garden Club year. And let's start it off the way we always do, hearing from our national leader, the National Garden Club President, Mary Warshower. Madam President, are you with us? I am here. Thank you, Trish. Welcome. Um, I just hope everybody's having a wonderful summer. This is the this is the time to enjoy that outdoors and play, and I do I do want to uh, just extend our thoughts and prayers to all of the states that have been suffering through the terrible floods, the mm-hmm. wildfires. I know tornadoes and hurricanes are coming, and um, just know we're all here for you and we feel for you, and always lend a hand to our kindred communities to see how we. But. Um, This is going to be a really, I can see by the number of people attending, this is going to be a very interesting and educational workshop. So I hope you all enjoy yourselves. And when you're done with this, go outside, take a little walk and play. Thank you. Thank you, Trish, for putting this together in the membership committee. We got a great um, crew and very proud of them. Thank you, Madam President. As we get ready to start our Garden Club year, I just want to remind everyone that there are nine Um, keys to success for any garden club meeting if you want to recruit new members. They're on your screen. You may have read about them in our social media page, National Garden Club Facebook or Instagram. Make sure that right before you start, you order name tags and wear your name tags so that people can actually look you in the eye and still be able to see your tag. So often we wear them down on our bellies or we wear them with the backs turned towards us. That doesn't help new members or people that might know who you are but can't remember your name to call you by name. And everyone likes to hear their name. So try to use names when you introduce people around. Also have signage. People that are coming to your club or people that are walking by a club meeting and might be potential members want to know who you are and what you're doing. Try to avail yourself of a sign outside your meeting place and especially one out at the road with the directional. If you have a new member, the last thing they want to do is get lost on the way to their meeting. So please make sure that you have good signage for all of your meetings. Post a member outside of your meeting or right inside the door to greet all members and potential visitors and guests. Everybody likes to see a friendly face, hear a nice warm welcome. Don't just have a sign up sheet. Avail yourself of social media. Even if you're not going to recruit new members from it, you will recruit donors, community partners, maybe some um, corporate donations, some in-kind donations. Always share the good news of what you're doing. And the easiest way to do that is Facebook and Instagram. Emails and call blasts are something that we often do. But if your email is like mine, you probably have 33,000 messages in your inbox. Don't risk your invitation getting lost in someone's email. If you have a small membership, pick up the phone and invite your members to the meeting. Tell them what the topic is, what they're going to bring, and maybe something special that you want to talk about while you're there. Have something to learn. People join Garden Club to learn, to grow, and connect. If they're not coming to your meeting and learning something, except for it's all business, they're going to tune out very quickly. So always be engaging your members. And lastly, food and fun make great friends. So I don't even have to say anything more about that. So let's talk about today's program. In your invitation, you received a pre-video to this presentation. And I hope you took the opportunity to watch that video. It's an excellent overview 
of parliamentary authority and how you can organize your club, state, or region so that you are the most um, well-rounded and easiest to make decisions by. This video covers bylaws, standing rules, parliamentary authorities like Robert's Rules and others. It also covers um, protocol, policies, and custom. So it's definitely a video that you want to check before your first meeting and also share with the members that you feel are instrumental in helping your organization flourish. We have a dynamic duo here for you today. Out of San Fernandina, California, is a professional parliamentarian and our National Garden Club Leadership Chair, Robin Pekorski. And with her is Patricia Arndt, our NGC parliamentarian, who hails to us from Martinsburg, West Virginia. Now, if any of you follow either one of these fine ladies on social media, you may have seen our national parliamentarian hugging and loving on a very <laughs> wild creature lately. If you happen to know what wild creature that was, and you're the first to answer correctly in the chat room, you may be one of today's winners. So without further ado, I give you the dynamic duo, Robin Pekorski and Patty Arndt. Patty? Thank you, Trish. And just to let everyone know, the wild creature was not my husband. I'll just give you that. Thank you all for joining us. Um, thank you, Robin, for being my uh, other half of my dynamic duo. I feel like I want to put on little black, um, you know, mask over my eyes. But um, today we're going to talk about parliamentary procedure and making it work for you and in your meeting. Um, I hope most of you had, or some of you had a chance to see the uh, preliminary recording in the video cafe. It is helpful. And I want to start out by saying parliamentary procedure is um, can be so intimidating. Believe me, I've been there, done that. There are moments when I'm still there, still doing that. Um, we are not perfect. We try to find all the right answers, and sometimes that takes a little effort. But today, let's talk about in a meeting about basically about who can vote um, and how to handle motions and how to make your meeting run a little more smoothly. So first of all, slide, we're going to talk about credentials. Credentials are important because that tells us who can vote and credentials should be outlined in your in your bylaws telling you who can vote or what committees are they on? Can committee chairman vote? Can your officers vote? Um, how many people from different areas or regions can vote? It's important to dictate that in your bylaws. And then once your meeting starts, you need to have someone, usually a credentials chairman or, or registrar, who can keep track of who is at that meeting and let you know who is eligible to vote. Now, a quorum is important because it tells you how many members need to be present at the meeting in order to do business. And notice I said how many members, not those present who can vote, but how many members? Um, in our club, for instance, we have about 24 members. Our quorum um, actually is set pretty low. So I think, Robin, I think the rule of thumb that we talked about was about 30%. And if yes. you can get, yeah, if you can get 30% of your members to a meeting, you're doing really well in this day and time. So it is important. Now, the next question, I'm going to talk to you about quorum before we change slides. If you have your, your credentials report and you have this many people, the members there, does that stay true during the whole meeting? And the answer to that is sometimes no. If you have members leaving a meeting, say they get some phone calls or they need to go out or they leave early, you need to have someone keeping track of how many members are still in that meeting because that quorum may not be met 
if people leave the meeting and don't come back. So that's important to remember. Quorum, the minimum number of members needed to be present in order to do business. What if there was like a cloth out in the lobby? We could lose if members like crazy. If there's what? Uh, if there's a sloth out in the lobby. <laughs> well, I know someone who might not be there and they're meeting them. <laughs> Very good. Um, so this is just a for instance. If you have 35 members in your club and your quorum says that it's 25%, then you're looking at at least nine members who have to be there. So 20 members are present, but only seven vote on a motion. Then the majority needed to pass the motion is four. The majority is the number of people who are voting, not the number of people who are in the meeting. And again, we go back to credentials. How many people can vote? How many of those credentialed folks are in your meeting? And then that will determine um, what your majority or your two thirds vote would be. And let me just say, I know we're going to have a lot of questions at each slide, and we're going to save all those questions for the end, but type them in the chat as they come to you so that we can address them at the very end. Pat. Thank you, dear. Now, handling a motion and making the motion. What is a motion? A motion is the proposal to the organization for action. It's something that you want to act on. It's a piece of business. It's an idea, but you need the members to act on it. So you present that to your organization in the form of what is called a motion. Now, so many times we hear, at least I have in meetings, um, a discussion will start up about something. And all of a sudden, you know, we'll say, well, do we hear a motion? And someone will say, so moved. Is that a motion? And the answer is no. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, no. Come on, Robin, that. speak up, honey. <laughs> don't say it. Don't say it. <laughs> you start a motion by saying, I move that. We do not say, and you can flip to the next, next one, please. We do not say, so moved. We don't say, Madam Chairman, I want to make a motion. And you don't say, I'll make a motion. Three little words. What are those I words? That. Ah, uh, yes. Next, next slide. In all caps, I move that. Music to my ear. Put that in your little um, memory banks, three words. And when you make a motion, please make sure that you make a detailed motion. I move that we make a donation to ABC group. Okay, that's a motion. But if I go back and look at my minutes later on, if I have to look at it for history purposes, Okay, I want to make, um, we went to make, we voted to make a donation to ABC Group. How much was the donation? When are you making it? From what account are you making it from? You want to be able to go back to your meeting minutes and see exactly the piece of business that was transacted. Not the generalization, but the exact wording. Now, once you make that motion, you usually have to have a second. And that ensures that at least two people in your group want to talk about it. <laughs> a second isn't necessary when discussion has already begun on the motion. The second is assumed. Sometimes we start talking about it and we're, we're actually talking in depth. So then we really don't need a second. We know that it's interesting that they want to proceed on it. And when a motion is brought from a committee Say, for instance, in NGC, when we do um, our bylaws, when, it, when they're presented, they have come from um, our organization study committee usually. Therefore, it does not need a second when it's presented to, to the executive committee. And the committee has to be then more than one person. If it's only one person, then you just have a regular motion. Okay. Do not beg for a second. If you ask for a second, 
and no one's saying anything. You wait a, just you know, a little, little while, I'd say maybe about 15, 20 seconds. That's to me, because if no one speaks up by then, then you assume that they're not interested and the motion dies for lack of a second. Okay, for those taking minutes, the seconder's name is not included in the minutes. In fact, the motion that was seconded, you don't have to put in the minutes that it was in seconded. Just that the motion was made and the maker of the motion. And minutes will show the motion exactly as it was stated and voted on. We don't edit it when we're putting it in the minutes. If I say I want a charcoal cat as our mascot, we're not going to go, well, I want a black cat as our mascot. <laughs> okay, that's the motion. Make sure it is exactly as worded. If you need it repeated, then ask for the motion to be repeated until it is put in exactly as it should be. I know in some meetings um, you can put a, a motion in writing. That's very helpful to give it, you know, to the to the chair and the secretary, so that they have it right there in front of them. Patty, yes, I'll, I'd add in there that um, a lot of our garden clubs, and particularly from uh, district up to the higher levels will mm -hmm. often send uh, motions through their executive committee. And that's mm -hmm. always helpful because if you're thinking you're at the garden club meeting and you've got this idea right now to, to um, make a motion about the uh, Arbor Day tree. Um, maybe you're not thinking it all the way through where if you send it through your executive committee, often you'll get then what fund is that paid from? Uh, what kind of a tree, what park is it going to be put in, and you come out with a much more complete motion. And so that's why yes. it's often good for us. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Robin. I appreciate that. You're exactly right. Um, so now handling a motion and debating the motion, you know. Um, the presiding officer's duty is to remain impartial. They can vote but usually they don't unless there is a tie to be broken. And then they have reserved their vote for that purpose. And there's also the officer's duty to ensure that all members have the opportunity to speak on any given business presented to the assembly. Every member has a right to be recognized and to speak on a topic. Now, I know that we can implement rules for meetings such as the speaker can only speak two minutes and maybe twice in a meeting. And that is to give everyone a chance to speak. We don't want someone to stand up and speak 15 minutes and monopolize the meeting. We want to make sure that we are fair and we give every member a chance to talk. And this is very, very important. I know that we have subjects that we are very passionate about. And sometimes we can get a little um, squirrely, <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, but the presiding officer should always ensure that the debate is civil and never directed to motives, to personalities, or individual members. It is never acceptable to attack another member during debate or even you, you need to think clearly Take the emotion out of it and know what you're, what you're really trying to debate. What is the actual thing we're trying to accomplish? And that is what you debate. Okay. Um, now, when you're debating emotion, sometimes there's something that, you know, well, you know, I sort of understand what they're asking about, but I'm really not sure. So at that point, you ask for, a point of information, Madam Chairman, point of information. And while the presiding officer can't speak to a motion without relinquishing the chair, without becoming impartial, she can, she or she can provide some a little additional information. And again, presiding officer has to be careful not to make his or her position on the motion known. That presiding officer must remain impartial, but they can provide information. Go ahead, Robin. 
I thought you were going to say. I got a, I got a good example of that. Let's say the motion on the floor is that that monies raised on the garden tour, tour will be used to buy a tree for Arbor Day. So a member might stand here and say, Madam President, point of information. Now your presiding officer, presiding officer is going to say, state your point. And the member would respond, don't our bylaws state that our tour benefits are the tour revenue benefits the scholarship fund? So that, that is where the presiding officer can very clearly say, oh, yes, we've gotten off point here. Right, you are. And actually, the words would be, if you want to be nice and formal, your point is well taken. And that's where that comes from. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Robin. See, this is why Robin is here. She's got all these great examples, and I love her. So thank you, dear. Okay, <laughs> okay now, sometimes we will start debating a motion, and we'll sort of go off on a tangent, not really talking about the motion, but saying, oh, you know, just talking about something that is remotely related to the motion, but really adds nothing to the debate. So at that time, it is appropriate for someone to say, uh, Madam Chairman, point of order, which means they want to bring it back, bring it back to actually what we're talking about so that we're not talking about things that, and taking up time from the meeting on things that aren't appropriate. So a point of information asks for more information on a subject. A point of order asks for the debate to come back to the actual subject that we're debating. Okay, next one. Oh, and here we are amending the motion, one of our favorites. <laughs> Sometimes we will have this amendment that we want to make or we want to, a, a motion, a motion. And say for instance, um, and I know Robin, you have a great one with this. With, 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 the, with the tree. So I'm going to let you talk about that. But it is to change a motion to edit it with a word um, or another idea. Um, and that amendment needs a second. Now, once you make that amendment, we're not going to debate the original, amend, the original motion that was presented. Now, once that amendment is 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 a motion is made for an amendment. You're only going to talk about what you are amending by that motion. Okay. Now, say for instance, that's a secondary motion amendment. Now, say for instance, oh well, we like the secondary, but I see something else different I want to make. You can make a tertiary or a third amendment. And again. Then you're going to start debating from the bottom up. So you have a main motion, you have a secondary motion, you have a tertiary motion, and then when you start to debate these, you'll start with the most recent amendment, which is the tertiary. You'll get that settled. Then you'll go back to the secondary motion and get that settled. And then you finally get to go to the main motion, which should have incorporated all these changes you made in the second and third. So go ahead, Robin. I know you had an example on that, honey. If you would put oh, that that's out the there. Example right in front of you, right in front of you. So if you're on your tertiary motion, the only thing you're going to discuss is, a, is that striking the word sycamore and changing it to maple. So if someone were to say, oh, and you know what? Let's make it, I move that we, because they're using the right words. I move that we're going to put it in Grant Park. No, that has to wait. Because now we're just talking about sycamore versus maple. And once we fix that up, yes, we can either add another tertiary or go all the way back to the main motion and then re still redo it. You can redo it as many times as you want. You just can't go deeper than that tertiary motion. That's it. Thank you, Robin. Voting on the motion. There are different ways you can vote. Um, ways that can be accomplished. You can do, of course, by a voice vote. All those in favor say aye, opposed, no, that's a voice vote. When the presiding officer is in doubt of the vote, because sometimes some people speak louder than the others, it may not mean you had more people speaking, they just sounded louder. Um, you can do a show of hands. The presiding officer can ask those to stand in favor or against, and then a counted standing vote. 
Um, but any member, when it's time to vote, any member can move to vote by a ballot. It needs a second in order to vote by ballot, but no debate. So there are several ways to handle the motion, several ways to vote. You have a choice. And Patty, it's always good to remember to be able to vote by ballot because there are things that, particularly when something is divisive, yes. and it might split up the club by saying, well, who voted for that? Who voted against that? Then yep. move to a ballot so that that is anonymous. You're exactly right. When, when the, when the uh, motion is on a sensitive topic or, use, like you say, a divisive topic, that is the best way to go. It pre pre uh, you know, presents division in the club. When you are voting on the motion, remember, take both positive and negative votes. You can't assume if a whole bunch of people says I that it's going to pass. You must always, always take the positive and then the negative. Don't worry about abstentions. Abstentions mean nothing. <laughs> they're not voting. So they're voting with the majority just by not saying anything. And then you announce the results. This is important. The ayes have it and you have voted to, and then you state whatever you action you performed, or the noes have it and the action or motion is defeated. So take both positive and negative votes. Abstentions don't matter and announce the results. Patty, okay. Patty, yes. just a point of order. Um, ab abstentions may come in every now and then if you're taking a roll call vote, correct? Correct. Okay. But okay. abstentions, they still don't mean anything. They're neither ne nor right. po negative or positive. Right. You just don't feel like voting. That's just basically it. Okay, or you have a reason for not voting. For not voting. Um, and the next slide, the general rule of thumb, when a motion gives something to members, then you usually need a majority vote. When the motion is taking something away from the members, it's generally a two thirds vote. Okay. Can you give us an example of that, please? Robin, would you like to give us an sure. example? Okay. Sure. We're going to give, we're going to, well, let's see, the, the taking away, uh, we're going to restrict, the, the bylaws is going to restrict some activity um, or that we're, oh, a dues increase. That's a good one. When the motion mm -hmm. is a dues <laughs> increase, that's going to be two thirds of you. Right. When um, I'm going to give you something, we're giving a, a, a Arbor Day tree to the local school. That's, that's a outward motion. I mean, it, it, it's something that's giving. That's generally going to be a majority vote. Now, there are some uh, specifics that would be, have to be, um, even if you're giving something, it has to be two thirds and vice versa. If you're taking something, it could be majority. But in general, that these are your rules of thumb. Um, another one is going to work, we're going to talk about in a moment is calling for the question. You are limiting debate. You are taking the right to continue discussing a motion away from your members, that's going to be a two thirds vote. Back Thank to you. you Thank you, ma'am. Okay, now unanimous consent. Um, it's also referred to as general consent. You use it when there's no apparent opposition. Um, for example, when the chair is appointing um, a, a committee, without objection, the chair appoints XYZ for this committee. Okay. I mean, 99.99%, no one's going to say, oh, no, I don't want, want this. Or if, especially if someone has resigned <laughs> without objection, you know, the chair accepts the resignations. Um, I don't think anyone's going to stand up and say, no, you can't. But when you know there's, or pretty sure there's not going to be any kind of um, opposition, go ahead. It speeds up your meeting um, without taking votes. And it, it precludes the necessity of going through the whole voting process, which in essence saves time. Now, the caveat Patty, to that is, yes. I'd like to always add here, never uh -huh. use unanimous consent for evil, must be used for oh. good. So don't <laughs> be trying to get something through when somebody's <laughs> in the bathroom or when they've looked at their text messages and they're not paying attention, you don't use it then. Go ahead. And also, if there is objection, then you must debate it and vote. Okay. Mm. 
that's it. So if, if she says, you know, without objection, um, I want to appoint so and so, and someone does say, um, Madam Chairman, I object, then you must open the floor to debate and to vote. Never stifle productive debate. Now, productive debate is when there is actually genuinely good questions coming up. We're getting good information to share, okay? Um, they can solve the problems if they are aired productively. And it may save your club, your organization, trouble down the road. Let them get their ideas out. Let them ask their questions as long as it is germane to the motion. You know, you don't want to ask questions about something that is either ha really has nothing to do with what the main motion is. But if it's germane, don't stifle that debate, which is going to bring us up to the next slide. Calling for the question and previous question. Is there a difference between these two? And the answer is no. So let's call for the question. Go to the next slide, honey. Okay, next slide. Okay. Um, next slide. We're going to learn to use these correctly. Okay. Calling for the question means that you want the motion to end the debate. Not to vote but to end debate because it's taking the right to further discuss the motion from your members. Again, we're taking something away. So it's going to require a two thirds affirmative vote to end debate. So if the motion calling for the question passes, then the, the, the uh, presiding officer immediately will say, you voted to end debate. The main motion before you is to blah, 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 all in favor say aye. So even if someone raises their hand after they have called for the question, oh, wait, I have one more thing to say. The presiding officer might say, and again, I say might say, <laughs> I'm sorry, the assembly has voted to dispense with any further debate. I believe that a great example would be in mm -hmm. order here because what we're doing is we're making a motion and before we're actually voting on that motion we're voting to stop debate on Talking that motion about it. correct so, stop about it. right so robin do you want to give us an example of that sure so we're going to uh we're we're debating the motion about uh, an arbor day tree in grant <laughs> park versus recreation park and we're saying why one is and and people our members are getting up and saying well Oh, you know, Grant Park has uh, better water uh, watering facilities. Ah, but Recreation Park needs the the rec, um, needs the tree, and it's going to go back and forth too long. And obviously, the the group wants it to go to Recreation Park, but we got a couple of holdouts for Grant Park. Someone may call for the question, and so immediately then, the presiding officer should say, or what I would say is. Um, the question has been called for. Are you ready to end debate? Because you're going to help um, to, yeah. because in general at our garden club meetings, we don't want to be calling for the question because it's another vote that we don't need to really take. If, uh, so, I mean, so a couple of, <laughs> oh, Trish, why did you ask me to do this one? So if, if, um, if I'm the presiding officer, I'm going to say the, you educate your members at the same time. Calling for the, the question will mean we're going to end debate. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. Thank you. The ayes have it. And we are going to end debate. The motion now before you is to plant a, our Arbor Day tree in Recreation Park. Somebody says, oh, Robin, Robin, wait, wait, wait. One more thing about the parking there. I'm sorry. Your, the assembly has voted to dispense has called for the question, we, and we move right on. They, there's no more, no more discussion, no matter how good the idea is. So try to get your members not to call for the question. That's usually, it really takes more time than it needs to, because you're, because really, your um, presiding officer needs to be driving that meeting. 
And when she sees, mm -hmm. or he sees, that the the motion really is is going to get a favorable response. And in this case, she can see that most of those people want that recreation park. And mm -hmm. we're not we're not coming up with any new productive debate. Then I would say, as presiding officer, before anybody calls for it, are you ready to vote on the question? And then you move forward without doing that. Okay. Yeah. Hope that answers and it. It does. Thank you, Robin. But one other thing that's really important is don't call for the question, quote, for evil. Don't do it because you just want to stop it. Okay? If it is productive debate. debate don't call for the question. Um, and Patty, if and, called, and Patty uh, it, further to that, if someone were to, if there is still productive debate going on and uh, someone does call for the question, maybe to shut somebody up, the presiding officer can certainly say, yes. calling for the question, that motion is not in order at this time as productive yes. debate is going to continue. Yes, and Trish, if you'll go to the next um, slide, honey, and you can see what, what we were talking about. Yeah, barring any further information from this debate, are you ready for the question? And then the next slide. You know, this motion is out of order at this time as there is still productive debate going on. So, again, Robin's right. The presiding officer needs to keep the finger on the pulse. And, of course, the parliamentarian, who should be beside the presiding officer, um, should be helping to gauge that for that presiding officer to keep them in tune with what's going on. Okay. Now we're going to talk about tabling a motion. How another way to handle it. Tabling should be used for setting aside a motion temporarily. Notice temporarily is in all caps in order to take care of more pressing business. Say for instance, you're, you're, you're having a really good meeting and you had a lot of business to cover, but there are a few items that you really need to get to and you might be running out of time. It, Madam Chairman, I move that we table this motion and then so that you can go on to other business. Generally, a tabled motion is usually, it must be taken off the table at the same meeting or it, quote, falls off the table and then must be reintroduced at another meeting. But tabling is used basically to um, get to more important business. That's what I'm going to call it. Um, Robin, you might have something else to compare let's, to. Let's say the motion on the floor is on, that's under debate, but now the speaker arrives. So the motion... Uh -huh and be tabled, okay. uh, Madam President or Mr. President, our a speaker has arrived, I move to table, or I would say that in a different order. I move to table the um, a motion uh, as our speaker has arrived. This, then the speaker speaks, and then you take from the table after the speaker is gone. Correct. Yeah, I didn't think about someone coming in a speaker, but yeah, but generally to, to do something that's more important than what you're working on right now. Basically, that's it. That's it. Okay, um, let's go to the next one. Do you want to speak about postponing a motion versus tabling? Oh, I was still on tabling. Okay, postponing a motion is different than tabling. Postponing a motion um, sets it aside during current business, but postponing is setting aside the current business to a specific time or meeting. Um, you might want to talk on something and say, well, Maybe we need to, to gather more information. Maybe we need to get more details. Uh, a, a member can say, um, Madam Chairman, I move that we postpone this um, discussion or, or motion until our next regular meeting. Or, um, But it must be have, have a specific time or meeting attached to it. Now, when you say, I move that this is postponed indefinitely, you're killing the motion. It's dead in the water. You can't bring it back at the meeting. Now, maybe at a future meeting, you can bring up the, the subject again. But as far as this motion, it's dead in the water. Postpone indefinitely equals dead. Remember that. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> easy. Dead. Okay. All right. Now, the role of the parliamentarian. Here we are. What's our role? We're helpmates. That's it. We're helpmates. We're an advisor. We can never make rulings, ever. 
That is the presiding officer's prerogative. That is their job. And during a formal meeting, we sit to um, the right of the presiding officer. We are there to help them, as I said, to help keep um, tabs of what's going on in the assembly, to help judge the climate that's going on there. Um, that's our job. We advise. And when we give out advice, it's up to the person who gets the advice to decide what to do with it. We can't say, you must, you have to. This is what, you know, Robert's rules might say, but the, the final decision is presiding officer or whoever is taking the advice. Okay. Um, and resources. Oh, yes, we have resources. Um, besides our own NGC website, I'm going to put that first and foremost, we do have resources on there. And again, I hope you do take um, the time to look at the video cafe recording that Robin and I did about a week or so ago. Um, the National Association of Parliamentarians has units in most states. Um, you can get on and I think you can search to see who's in your area. If someone's local, if you need them to, maybe you don't have a parliamentarian, you want someone to come to a meeting to act as a parliamentarian, you know? Um, if there's someone in your area, you can certainly research it. Um, they're always really um, glad to help you. I can tell you when I took courses from NAP, they were a great group, um, really, really helpful and easy. I, I don't want to say easy, but comfortable, comfortable learning environment. And of course, right now, Robert's Rules newly revised the 12th edition and the little accompanying um, book of Robert's Rules 12th edition in brief. In brief, just again, more little concise answers, quick. Basically, it's Robert's Rules for Dummies. That's what I call it. Cliff notes. <laughs> cliff notes. Yes, cliff notes. That's good. Cliff notes. Um, and again, there are the um, websites, parliamentarians.org or robertsrules.org. You can always reach me at my um, email address, jpjarn at comcast.net. And um, I know Robin and, and, and Greg Rikorski have been wonderful resources. Um, I am very, very pleased to know that I have such wonderful people that can help me when I have a question. You have a lot more experience. So that is it, guys. And I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Patty. And Robin, if you would just give us a quick recap of takeaways that everyone should be jotting down. Sure. So in, in parliamentary uh, procedure altogether. Don't be afraid of it. Just learn your basics and that's going to get you through 90% of what you need. That that big Roberts book um, that we always say in the parliamentary world, you, you only, you, you look 80% of the time you look, use less than 20% of the book. Take your time. When you're in a meeting and, and, and it's getting hairy, take your time. Ask for the help from your parliamentarian and, and practice, practice the words, uh, get a little comfortable. I have plenty of words written out. So if anybody wants those cheat sheets just for the words so that they kind of roll off your tongue, go ahead and email me. Um, then beyond that, I would, my, uh, the things I always have to um, get on my little soapbox are about uh, try not to be calling for the question. I educate your members not to call for the question. Um, probably... 90% uh, of the time, your clubs are not tabling something. They are postponing for the, uh, for the, to the next meeting because they need to find out how much it's going to cost to rent that venue. They don't need <laughs> to table it. They need to postpone it. And that's about it. I think I love it. I, t I began my parliamentary career when I knew I was going to be president of California because I <laughs> wanted to be up there with a little more confidence. So I think Robert's rules, somebody in um, chat said, what's, what's to be gained by knowing Robert's? And I said, I'm thinking it gives you some confidence. Thanks, Trish. Yeah, Thanks, yeah. Patty, you were great. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, as we wrote, as you read in the introduction and the invitation to today, um, there's an old saying in baseball. When everyone knows the ground rules, you have more time to enjoy the game. So my takeaway from this is just knowing the basics, practicing the basics with your officers, not beating people up with it or using it to prove how smart you are, but to just help your business abbreviate and flow naturally. I, I'm a very big fan of Robert's Rules because it helps get rid of the business so that we can get to the stuff that we really love doing. And that's the programs, the projects, and the food and the fun. So thank you to this <laughs> dynamic duo. Thank you, Patty and Robin. If you would like more information, go to www.parliamentarians.org or www.robertsrules.org. This has been a workshop of the National Garden Clubs Incorporated.